Hi everybody, um, it's great to be back here tonight for the last time. We've got the amazing Keith Harris going to join us very shortly for the second part of his story. And thank you very much to everybody for all the great comments and all the lovely remarks that you've been making. A message you've been sending to us about you know our virtual chair and our Instagram lives. And we're going to finish off with an absolute brilliant story here from Keith. When we were talking to Keith on Thursday night, we finished up and he was... In LA, um, um, working within the movie business and literally having the greatest life you could imagine as a hairdresser. And we're, we're, but we're going to take it back a little bit further because what we didn't get the chance to talk about um, to Keith on Thursday night was just what he'd been doing up, up until that point because uh, obviously he had had this incredible relationship with Wella for many, many years. Um, I wanted to find out a little bit more about how that came to an end because it seemed to be it seemed to be a marriage made in heaven. I mean, not only was Keith responsible for completely reinventing the image of Wella, but uh, very much, you know, created images that kind of represented what the great brand Wella was at the time. So welcome along, Keith. How are you tonight? Good evening. I'm all right. I just want to let you know, we've got um, someone's building a kitchen next door. So it's like a building site. And some fella, I don't say, you know, keeps ringing me. So, I've no idea. But apart from that, I'm fabulous. You're looking very colourful this evening. <laughs> well, it's actually very, very grey in Belfast. So I thought I'd wear a little bit of Indian Madras check to cheer us all up, which is the traditional summer attire for the Ivy League. If you, if you ever follow any of the oh, Ivy League. Poor, beautiful. So, especially for you, um, okay, so Keith, when we finished up on Thursday night, um, we'd, re we'd already found you in LA and you were doing Farrah Fawcett's hair and hanging around with supermodels and movie directors and, 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 uh, and um, the, the, the who's who of Los Angeles. But I want to take you a little bit back to a time when I really remember you, which was the 90s and your relationship with Wella, because we didn't really discuss that on... Thursday night, and I think that's where a lot of people remember you from. Give us a little bit of an insight into how you how you first became involved with Wella and why it came to an end. Hello. Okay, sorry, you're coming in and out, Paul. So I think I heard your question. Um, okay. Well, I actually got signed by L'Oreal in uh, 1990 uh, as an. And um, I had two years with them. I think I said this the other evening. And then must have been the end of 92 is when I first went Avant Garde. It was the first time. And at the, on the night, uh, a lovely man, Kevin Arkell, who was quite high up at where he came over, uh, set up a meeting, and then we did the deal, which I told you about the calendar, etc. And then they changed MDs, and they, uh, a lovely man called Steve Lowe became the MD, and uh, Wilfred Ritzer was the chairman. Anyway, the brilliant relationship with them, and all the heads that were, Wilma Sladen, Sheila Jackson, Peter, lovely, lovely people, real people. And seriously, like a family, you know, I think it really felt that way. And they just looked after me, and they would give me a couple of projects here and there, and totally entrust me. I didn't once have someone leaning over my shoulder telling me we want it looking like this or we want it like that. It was, as I used to say, drum is drum and fizzle is fizzle, which I thought was a great <laughs> expression. And mm. they just let me do what I did. And it worked out uh, that everything became a success. We probably did over nine year period. So they signed me once a year for a year. Um, and we did the calendar, we did a book for the millennium, I did a book which featured people like Tim Hartley, Mark Hill, all the sort of, um, you know, the, the big accounts um, from Wella. Um, I had to reshoot um, the entire Hollis in 2000 that came in Germany because it wasn't looking good. So, some quite big projects for Wella UK and they trusted me and it worked brilliantly. And of course, the lovely part, as I explained the other evening too, is it took me all over the world. 
you know, I mean, they literally, I toured Australia. Uh, myself with Trevor Layton, a wonderful photographer. We went to South Korea twice. Because what I did, I set up a club at Weller, which was called Weller Elite, which I tied up with the Elite Mods Agency in London. And I believe it or not, I actually did the first ever photographic seminar, to the best of my knowledge, which signed up was for L'Oreal, which got me my contract with L'Oreal. And of course, hairdressers would come and sit in, and I'd have a team of people, and they'd come in and just watch and see how it was done, and see the final result. And then from there, we started doing photographic seminars where they could come and do a model themselves. And as you know, hands on, that's how you learn, right? But I was their safety in that. Um, and the membership of Weller Elite was huge. We had like 60 salons, I think. Uh, who were all doing four pictures a year. So it was a great thing to do. And they uh, kept me busy, which was lovely. Um, and it just went through until 1999. So it was nine years, consecutive years. And then, fortunately or unfortunately for me, and maybe other people too, Props and Gamble came in and did a takeover, which of course for people like me meant nothing, because that's not what I do. But they literally came in and just bam, and a lot of people were moved on within the country. You know, the rest is history. Everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And so from that point of view, it put me out on a limb. And I had, you know the story, I had been approached by a and other company two or three months before who offered me an amazing deal, amazing deal. But mm -hmm. at that point, I, I thought I'd already been told by whether they were re-signing me because nobody knew about the state over. So I turned down this fantastic offer out of loyalty because Weller was terrific to me. I felt I owed them that. And three months later, I was out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> but retrospect is a wonderful thing. I um, mean, and in, term, in terms of your, what, what opportunities were available to you at that stage? Or was it simply a door closed and you didn't know where you were going? Yeah, I think at that time it was a bit, it was difficult. And as you know, um, you know, I, I started doing the divorce and everything else. And you know, it was all a bit tricky. Anyone's been there that road knows. And your head's not been your own. Um, but I explained to you, I was, I was starting to travel over and back to America. And, um, you know, I was working with some serious A-list clients, which you can't work with in London because they're in Hollywood. Um and that was a terrific opportunity. So it was like a logical next step, but how we got there wasn't planned, if you like. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just took, by the, took the ball by the horns. Um, the hardest part about the States was letting my boys know that I was going to live in another country. And Ryan was always very adult. And I went in 93, so he would have been eight. And I just sat down with him and I said, look, Ryan, you're in Ireland, I'm in London. We have to get an aeroplane to see each other, right? Two hours, he went, yeah. I said, well, you come to Los Angeles for your holidays in the summer, you get an aeroplane for eight hours. And he went, oh, all right. <laughs> so that was great. And they did, the, the, I was out there three and a half years, and for three summers, they came over and, you know, I had a pool at the apartment. I mean, they, you know, for a little boy, so it's like his dad's swimming pool. I mean, we were living the dream. Yeah. So, but, um, you know, um, yeah. So ju just to, uh, I mean, obviously your type of work was international. You could do your hairdressing all over the world. But what was the significant differences between British hairdressing and American hairdressing at that time? Because in recent years, American hairdressing has become phenomenal. But back then, it was still a little bit dated. Did you find that? Now, when you say um, American hairdressing, it's become incredible. Are you talking platform wise or are you talking Midwest salon in the high street? There is well, actually, fun I think the industry in general in the United States has become progressive on all levels, not just not just the, the editorial and the show work, but actually the educational work and the session work. I mean, obviously, I spend a lot of time out there, so you can see how much it's developed over the last 20 years. But when you went out, 
it was still pretty much New York or LA, and in between was unknown. Well, you know, for, for the bit of the the business that I'm in and, and the work that I do, it's still the same for me. I mean, New York was always a hub of the creativity, right? And that goes way back, you know, people like Darren, uh, you know, uh, some serious session people in New York. Howard Fugler, who I used to wash hair for it, the Zoos. He was the younger ever, we only said the top stylist at 18, Bidal Jr. He ended up the biggest session hairdresser in America. Do you know, he did 11 Vanity Fair covers on the truck, January to November, and worked with everybody wow. from Beyonce, whoever it was, Howard was their hairdresser. And one of my claims to fame is that um, he was hairdresser to Shania's Twain. And I got to work with Shania and I stayed with him. So for me, that was amazing because he was another one on, on a statue for me. Brilliant, brilliant. Born to do hair, unlike me. He was born to do it. Um, and I think while I was over there, I saw the move. The magazine had to stop featuring models and started showing celebrities. Even the glossy, glossy magazines. It was like they wanted actresses and celebrities. So the people that were switched on hair and makeup wise made the move to LA and some of the big New York photographers did. So the whole uh, the whole sort of thrust of it changed. Which made it harder for me because it's just brought all the talent in the LA. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, great time, great time and uh, I like some pesticides anyway. Uh, but it's a little bit, I, I think I said the other night, you know, Hollywood's very city. It's very much who you know, which I don't have a problem with, but people fit into little groups and I didn't fit into any of them. Yeah. <laughs> and did you find that? Did you feel that? Did you feel like you didn't fit in? Oh, it's in your face all the time, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's all the cliches about over there are cliches for a reason. Like, I can remember. When I was working with Pamela Anderson, right, I, it's a very famous English pub in Studio City where you'll bump into one of the Monty Python boys or, uh, you know, uh, an EastEnders actor over on, you know, it, it's like Little London, Little England. Mm. And um, when I was doing Pamela's hair, I'd come back from the session, I, I had a bunch of English mates in there. And... Everyone, everyone wanted to be my mate. It was bizarre. Not the English boys, the Americans. Everyone wanted to be your pal. Just, you matter. Mm. And then eventually, once that ran its course with Pamela, because it always does over there, you're not available for a job, and it's good night. Unless you strap yourselves to them, you know, you've got to be 24 hours a day. Different setup. Uh, and all of a sudden, I just noticed there was a difference. People's attitudes. And it, it is very, very shallow. I mean, the, the point with it over there, materialistically, if you've got enough money, you can live like a team. The weather is phenomenal. You can eat well for not a lot of money. You can buy anything you want in Hollywood. Everything and everybody looking at it is for sale. Um, it's a different mentality. And to be quite honest, uh, when I used to go over and back, it was always fun because I had a return ticket. Once mm -hmm. I was living there, and I didn't have a return ticket, and I was paying rent on an apartment, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it, rubbed, it rubbed off a little bit. I had some terrific times. I'm, I did some amazing people's hair. Mm -hmm. You know, women that I wanted to marry, like Brooke Shields. I was out to her house every Thursday and blows her own hair, <laughs> for example. I mean, it was mad. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you miss British hairdressing at all at that stage, or was that left far behind? Was that a different No, thing? because you get into a bubble over there, and it, it really is celebrity-driven. I can't explain it. It, it, it. Unless someone goes and works there, they can't mm. imagine. I mean, for example, just to get one example, um, I had a friend who was a big Asian. Um, she was Asian, so he's Ledger, Colin Farrell, Farrah Falls there. Her list is incredible. She started off in a town the Motown back in the 60s. I mean, it's extraordinary story, her. But she's one of the, uh, one of the biggest like, personal agents in, in her life. Um, through, through Richard Mattel, we became friends. I changed her hair 
it was like news. And of course, she started taking me around with her as friend. And um, she introduced me to so many people. But anyway, I met, and I'm not name dropping, I'm just telling you the story. Uh, I met Dan Ackroyd, uh, associate, who she looked after. Uh, in fact, I met him at a lunch where they gave John Belushi his star on Hollywood, you know, on the pavement. And I was like in this roped off area at Frank Sinatra's old favourite restaurant. <laughs> and I'm sat with a couple of actors from Cheers that I recognise. I'm in the faces. And I was on that side of the red tape. And then, of course, the other side, you've got 2,000 people screaming out for Dan Ackroyd, et cetera. Very bizarre experience. Mm. Anyway, from that, I started to do Dan's wife's hair. And I used to go to the house. Um, and then, I can't remember where we started with this, but anyway, an example of what goes on. You know, it's, you just get trapped into that. So I don't want to tell you. So, my boys were over for the summer. I, I, I sent to their favourite restaurant, which is some uh, trendy American place in Studio City. They didn't have pancakes and whatever they want. We ordered their food. You know when they're little, they need to eat, right? Literally, I ordered their food. My phone rang. It was 10 to 10 in the morning. And it was the Asian, and she said, Donna, who is Dan's wife, want, needs her hair done. So I went, yeah, no problem. When? She went, now. I went, well, just what the boys have been breakfast. Yeah, you need to be there now. Now, you would like to say, sod off, and mm. you're done. Or I had to say to my boys, boys, I'm really, really sorry. They're little faces. So we drove through McDonald's, and then they were happy. Then. So we went hurting down to um, Japan, where, where he lives. And I do done this here, and you are staff. That's what you are. You're hired help. Mm -hmm. And although they pay you fantastic, I mean, it, you've got the right agent, you earn mad money, mad money. But I said, you only ever dreamt of. But you work for it, you know, you don't get there. No one's giving you anything. And when you're there, you've got to be so on. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it's an experience that I went through. Uh, and it's a great part of what I've done. So I'm not, I've got no regrets about it. But will I go back again? No. And not, did, not did you miss anything about the UK? I mean, did you miss the industry? Did you miss, you know, I, I miss, mean... I miss, my, I miss my mates. I miss the sense of humour. Yeah. I didn't miss the weather. Um, I miss a bit of the tea. You know, it just seems comfortable things. I miss my mum, but you've got the phone. Um, no, no, I mean, I, I was there and, um, I mean, I worked in Italy for seven years. Once you go where you go, you have to immerse yourself. There were, there were so many people in LA who were British who were like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm just wondering about And then they wonder why they don't succeed. Yeah. You know what it's like. It's like anything. Everyone wants to be with Al Sassoon. Are you prepared to put yourself through the pain? Yeah. You know that. Yeah. And I'm sure that people... <laughs> Things I've always wanted to ask you, Keith, and I've, I've never even asked you this in, in when we've been, you know, out for dinner or speaking. Did you ever think about ending up working in a salon? Yeah, my own. Yeah. I had... If you have respect in your life, right? I mean, I'm a one-man band. I always have been a one-man band. I hated taking all this, even when I was a 15-year-old apprentice. I hate being told <laughs> what to do. Always was a rebel. <laughs> Always a rebel, and for a lot of a bad. Like, it's just the way I'm made. It's where I grew up, how I grew up. This is that I grew up with, right? Mm. Um, I had some incredible offers to open a salon, but I would be the worst employer in the world because once again, going back to my roots, and I'm not a gangster, I'm a ladies' hairdresser. But mm. if, I, if I employed somebody and I thought they were taking the neck, I'd have to punch them. But the trouble is, because most of our, our world are girls, and I'm delighted that they are, you can't do that. So I wouldn't be able to... Yes, you're not allowed to punch them if they're guys either. Sorry? You're not allowed to punch them if they're guys either. No, but you are, because you're a man. So uh, no, <laughs> that's, that's why, as I said to you, I've been Let no as a boss. <laughs> the news of Keith Harris are entirely his alone. <laughs> Say that again. Let me just express to our listeners that the views <laughs> of Keith Harris are entirely his own. 
Yes, it's, I, I apologise. It's just my South London roots. And I'm not a fighter, that's the point. But no, if, I, I mean, if I'm giving my heart and soul to something, anyone around, even in the studio, I can get very um, sexy because, you know, we're here, we've got, so we're trying to create for a perfect here, right? We're never going to do that, but we're going to do the best that we can do. And I will absolutely give my blood. Anyone that cares, I learned that from Trevor and Robert and Aldo, you know, they did everything plus. And that's why they, who are, they are, they are who they are. So as I told you, if I'm stroking the bottom of their, their garment every day, I'm trying to get some of that magic. And unless you concentrate 100%, you know, you're the same when you work. It has to be what it has to be. So someone on the team has, has got themselves into that situation. And we've got a top brilliant photographer, and we've got a wonderful mate of If someone in the team isn't giving their blood, I don't want them in the studio. Yeah. But unfortunately, even now, if you express that view, <laughs> uh, people don't want to hear it because it's all the PC nonsense. Yeah. And I'm afraid in the real world, and that was the thing about Hollywood, everybody tells you how fabulous you are, but they'll stab you as soon as, you look, as, soon as they look at you. Yeah. So, but at the end of the day, bottom line, it's a brutal world we live in, and we're just on what we produce. Mm. So, so yeah. So anyway, I didn't, I didn't like the salon. It's a bottom yeah. line. Your time in the United States came to an end, and you found yourself back in Italy, your spiritual home. Uh, yeah. How did that happen? How, how did you end up back in Italy? Well, I'm going to spray my throat. Excuse me. <laughs> well, a dear friend of mine. Excuse me. Salvatore Suizio, who was a partner with Alla Coppola uh, in Palma uh, back in the late 70s, <clears throat> the richest town apparently before my time, the richest town in Italy was Palma because, excuse me, because all the, um, the factories, La Fabrica, they call it in San, you know, factories uh, for clothes were all in that area, okay? So Armani, Versace, Plan, all of them, the clothes were made in Parma. And it's a lot of old Italian money. It's an old town, the Roman town. The Roman bridges are still there, where the Parma ham comes from. And so Aldo, who not only was an amazing hairdresser, he was also a serious businessman, very shrewd, shrewd man. Um, there was so much wealth in Palma, and Aldo's wife used to travel to Palma about once, one week end in every four, and go shopping. And you were buying all the top designers, maybe 20% less, because they were made up, I don't know the detail. But she's obviously Franco, her name is Franco Coppola, still alive, God bless her. Uh, apparently she said to, to uh, Aldo, you know, you should really think about, there's so much wealth there. So Albert promptly took up the whole of the first floor of the building and made it the top of the salon. Anyway, the guy that he took out from Milan, Salvatore, known as Reno, uh, Reno Trisha, he went and he ran uh, the salon there. So, we, because I was out with an assistant as well, I used to go to Parma when he went, because he would appear once every six Saturdays. And, you know, the very, very rich seniors will all be queuing up waiting for Senior Aldo to touch him at, at crazy money. Um, anyway, I got Paddy with uh, Reno. Uh, one thing led to another. Um, we, we became best, best friends. And then when I came back to England, he would come over. He had a brilliant relationship with my mum. My mum loved him. And he, would, he loved my mum. Like, mum, blah, 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 blah. So, um, I'm in America. I'm coming back. I don't know what to do. And he's really me telling me about this Italian fella that he knows who's opened his own product line. And uh, we know his exact words were, this fella needs Chief Harris. He doesn't need a Chief Harris. He needs Chief Harris. And I'm like, all right, we know. And we know wasn't a BS because he taught me a lot of stuff. I mean, he was a brilliant, they were great hairdressers. So long story short, I went over, met this bloke that I wasn't sitting in love with. Um, but he had the new business. I had complete control to do what I want photographically for him. He wanted me to create like a road scene and take it out. So it was what I was good at doing, or what I was my best stuff. 
And of course, it was great because I controlled back in the studio. And um, so we went on that journey. All I would say about this particular man, the companies are very well. I, I mean, I was with them for the next three years. But now I couldn't bear. I hate, I say what I, I can't bear is dishonesty. I hate liars. Uh, whether it's, well, if it's your friend, they wouldn't be your friend because your friends don't like to each other, right? But in business, you know when people biz themselves up? Mm. Well, eventually you're going to see through it. And I saw through this boat very, very early on. And the world being the world, at one point he'd been a salesman for Aldo because Shopler has product lines all over the place. And of course, it's at the moment where we're all in a room gazing across and Aldo just said to me, what are you doing with him? And I wasn't comfortable anyway. And he mm. just said to me, it's not correct. That was Italian words. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, listen, I feel, you know, I went around Italy and I've got a bit of a reputation, so that was okay. And, uh, and then from that... Mm. Keith, where were you at that stage? I mean, were you, was it just a job at that stage or were you still doing stuff that you loved doing? Well, I was very fortunate because I met a photographer, Paolo Renfale. And if you look at my Instagram page, she's how it's here, <laughs> you'll see lots and lots and lots of imagery that I did with Paolo. Brilliant, brilliant photographer. Unfortunately, Paolo, he likes to do what he likes to do. Very Italian boy. And he likes to photograph Ferraris. And he likes to photograph £100,000 watches, uh, etc. So when I've got him in the studio, our, our um, chemistry is unbelievable. You know, when it's like a bit like you and Leon, it's just that, that blend. And I've yeah. been very, very fortunate because so I've had it with a few photographers over the years. But Paolo and I, he says we make magic to them. That's what he says. And, you know, some of the stuff he's done is brilliant. So he kept me sane because, mm. like, we were doing a job and they would want soft Italian, pretty, through through, and all that. I get all that. That's what they're paying you to do. But we've been working with some of the top girls in the world who are in Milan for the shows or whatever. And we just look at each other and I said, Paul, I've got a great idea for her here. And he'd say, we'll do it afterwards. And we'd chat the girl up and push through the day they were happy so they were prepared to get the last train back to Milan. Or we might be in Milan shooting it anyway. Mm. Um, so he was great. And he's still a mate. Uh, in fact, well, after my illness, he was the first person who came to get me out of the hospital and put me in the studio for half a day. When I couldn't stand up, because yeah. he just says, he tells me, he tells me maestro, <laughs> which, you know, Aldo Coppola is maestro, he tells me maestro, he said, maestro, we have to get in the studio. And he took me in, which was beautiful, you know. And, and, and even now we talk about doing it, but it's pinning him down, because he's yeah. always, I think he's a diver now, so he's an Olympic diver, that's his new hobby. I mean, <laughs> different. Different worlds, different worlds. Keith, I, I think at this stage, I think, you know, you've literally done everything up to this point. You know, you've been avant-garde here this year. You've had incredible opportunities, worked with, you know, the greatest photographers. I mean, it really looked like nothing could go wrong. And, and you've always been quite robust. But while you're in Italy, your health, mm. you had a major health issue. I mean, a near right. death experience. Do you yeah. mind maybe talking about how that came around? Were you aware well, that you... Well, I, well, I think we're straight over it. But I, 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 for those, I, and I think it's been well documented. The lovely uh, Emil, uh, remember Emil, used to be at Weller. Yeah. For, for just sake, it's so lame. Sorry, Emil. I think it's so lame. That's ridiculous. Anyway, uh, the lovely Emil did a story about my illness. And, uh, bless his heart. And I knew him well enough. But it's quite hard to talk, talk about it, but... You know, I just basically, I mean, from the age of 13, I thought I was Mr. Party Animal Rock and Roll from the age of 13, right? Everything you're not supposed to do, I did to excess because <laughs> I'm a rock and roll animal. My father died at 37 as a, a casualty in the music business. It's just in the genes. Anyway, I had a fantastic time. I loved every minute of it. <laughs> um, but uh, the point with it was it, it's about to catch up. And of course, uh, I was actually flying over to New York. I was on an aeroplane. I had a bit of sore throat. I was probably smoking 40 or 50 cigarettes every day. Plus, I was drinking whatever I was drinking. I mean, party animal. So, after seeing five different doctors back in Italy, 
of the five months, they all just said, yeah, add these antibiotics. By the six months, I knew something wasn't right and it wasn't cured. And uh, a girl that I knew, his father had been a famous doctor, just to shut me up moaning, because it was very painful at the end. She took me to see this fella who used to study under her father, and by pure, pure luck, he's rated the top throat cancer surgeon in Europe. Not really in Europe. So that, my mum's looking after me. I don't know how I... In all the world, Parma in Italy, right? Which is like a massive, massive hospital. It's like a small town. Um, anyway, he looked down my throat, and he took... Um, you know, he, he literally got a little pair of tweezers and let me send them. Took a uh, whatever you call it, you know, it's that sample. Uh, and he said to me, just to let you know, you have got throat cancer. And he could tell that's just by looking at it. And I was like, right, okay. But I knew I did, mm. sort of inside. So he said, back in, to come back to see me today. So I went back and he said, um, okay, he said, yes, you've got throat cancer. He said, but unfortunately, now I know nothing about cancer. He said, unfortunately, he said, the virus that you have won't respond to chemotherapy. So I said, well, what does that mean? He said, surgery. And I went, <laughs> I don't think so. He said, you'll be dead in six weeks. He said, wow. and you'll smell so bad, not even your family will want to come into the room. <laughs> so I said, when are we doing it? Said, yeah. I said, when are we doing it? He said, day after tomorrow. And that was the start. So 11 hour surgery, recovered. They then sent me, recovered well over about a two and a half month period, three months. My face went from out here to that, you know, lesser. And then um, that two and a half months later, they sent me in for radiotherapy, which basically burns everything away so it can't grow back. Okay. And I spoke to two people I knew, who knew about radiotherapy, their wives said, yeah, nothing to worry about. Anyway, long story short, they did an extra week. I was out for five weeks, they did the six weeks. And the first five weeks, no pain. The six weeks was like torture, like pain that I never had. I just put a light across my face for three minutes and I was literally hanging on to the chair. The pain was extraordinary. And then about a month later, two of the surgeons, because I had six surgeons for my cancer, Two of the surgeons um, I become friendly with. One was this beautiful French girl, and the other one was uh, an Italian boy. And I used to cut their hair at my friend's son in Parma. And uh, if they wrote a problem, they just said, Bring me. So I ran, went in to see them. It was like a private thing, and it wasn't, they were mates. And I said, I'm getting so much pain here with, after the radiotherapy. Anyway, he put this thing in my mouth, and he pulled it out. And I went, what is that? He said, it's your jawbone. It's all broken up. And I said, so you mean to say, oh, this in there? He went, yeah, it's all bone. So he said, imagine like a chicken bone where it loads over So I said, so what now? So he went, surgery. I went, I'm not going through that again. You'll be dead with septicemia. I thought, and it's righteous. So I went back in again, another 11 hour operation. Um, but I went into a coma, I had the last rites twice, apparently. Uh, it went set, they took my shin bone out to rebuild my uh, my face. This is shin bone and metal plates and all sorts like that. I've since had about four or five little operations, which I'm going. Anyway, there's this little Ryan, uh, my leg went gangrene, and I asked Ryan at 16 to sign a form so that they have to take my leg. And he said, you don't want to know my dad. If he wakes up in one leg, he's not going to be happy. <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> and he said, you must be able to do something else. Anyway, they've got a, they said, well, there's a guy in Milan who's a plastic surgeon who's operating some new system, uh, cleaning out sinews and veins. We can give him a call. So Ryan said, well, why don't you do that? Anyway, apparently he came down overnight. Ryan came in in the morning. I wasn't in my bed. He started dying. I was back in the main wall. This bloke had magically cured me. And um, basically, I was I couldn't walk for a year. And I was told that I would never walk again, I would never talk again, and I wouldn't ever be able to eat. Well, I'm talking and I'm walking, and I eat. So uh, if you want to do it, you do do it. And I told you, my surgeon in Italy, who I'd go back and see, 
it's always been less of us because they can't work out when I'm still alive. <laughs> and I don't know. They stay at work, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I'm a very, very lucky boy, but the love of my son, Ryan, and of course, Jamie, my other boy, but Ryan was there and he became a man. I mean, we went through a baptism of fire and in all fairness, three of my friends from England came and sat apparently for an hour for, for a week. When I was in the coma, sat with him for a week in the dark room. So, you know, I owe them my eternal thanks. And I'm back, and here I am, and I feel terrific. I mean, obviously, I ate some pains, and I think I've been to four hospitals in the last 10 days, seeing different specialists about different bits and pieces. But you either are a victim and then, or you say, I'm a South London boy, and I want to get on. Yeah. I, some bit. We, um, I've never heard you in all the times that we have um, met up or talked on the phone. I've never heard you feel sorry for yourself or show any type of, you know, look for sympathy. And actually, when we first met again after many years at the British Heard Us No Awards judging, um, you, were, you were celebrated and treated like one of the long lost great sons of the industry. Uh, and at the awards, yeah, at the judging, yeah, everyone was up there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what did it feel like whenever you, you made that comeback into the industry? Because, well, and we'll talk a little bit more about your comeback after that, but it was really your first steps back into the industry that it time was, we were judging the award. That, when I came in that room in Epsom that day, that's the first time I'd seen anyone for six years. Yeah. And uh, as you said, I mean, I walked in, the room was packed, as you know, I know hundred and odd people. And um, I sat down and a hand came over my shoulder with a glass of red wine. I'm not a super a glass of red wine. And I stood up, it was Robert, the better. If Brad Bowles and me and Jimmy says, and then bundles of people came over, including yourself. And um, no, it was lovely that people remembered you. Um, but I just find it uh, frustrating because I have no problems in coming back, uh, if that's the right term. It says, for six years, when you're laying down staring at a wall and you've got a lazy coming to your house every day to take you to the bathroom because you can't walk. Uh, so when you're that all of course, all I'm concerned about are my two boys and me trying to get my career back. Okay? So mm. um, that's <clears> been <throat> the thing that kept me going. Those two things, the boys and trying. getting a great amount of encouragement from the hair business. Yeah. Um, you know, press-wise, I've had a couple of nice little write-ups and all that. I have a dear friend, Alison Jameson, who I work with at Trevor's, who used to perm my mother's hair, who's been a PR in Edinburgh for 20 odd years. And at the goodness of our heart and friendship, she and her girls helped me up. And then, of course, I had the concept, which we called um, No Limits, and mm. then through Sheila Jackson, well, it was the last one there that I knew, who retired two months later, sadly. Um, I did my comeback night, the first time I stood on a platform in, in London in 16 years, at No Limits, at Well of London. I think the room 650, there were 182 people in there. You were there, thank you very much for coming over. A lot of faces in the room. And that reception that night was beyond my wildest dreams. I mean, you don't get a standing ovation in London. Robert Lebeck in America is and pick up the vent brush and they go mares and stand up and, and cheer mm. with them, stand in the ovation for picking up a brush. Over in England, you're always at the world. I only ever saw Trevor Sorby at a stand ovation ever at the Grove House. Yeah. And you know, yeah. at the end of that thing that we did, the room went berserk. It was beautiful. Yeah. And then we I mean, the, th mm. yeah. the thing that I felt about No Limits, and obviously I had a little bit of a preview to it because you come up yeah. to my house. And uh, the thing is, it's such That's your opinion. Yeah, it's such a huge spectrum of work in actually quite a short space of time. I mean, it's not fifty years; it's only like a twenty-five year um, span. But a bit, a bit more, a bit more than that. Okay, but. <laughs> But I mean, in terms of the actual body of the work, it's phenomenal. And, and I, I remember saying to you at the time, 
you need to get, get this on social media. This needs to be on Instagram, which you were completely opposed to. And now you are an Instagram prostitute. Well, if I had half a million followers, I definitely would be. I'm a bit of a part-time whore at the moment. <laughs> but, um, you know, we're trying. We're trying. I mean, once again, I mean, it, it does make me laugh. Um, you know, there are hairdressers out there, and we're not naming names. But, you know, I see them with, like, you know, 400,000 followers. Mm -hmm. But when you look at their pictures on a daily basis, there's 80 people, like, well... That doesn't work out. It's not my son Ryan. That's not how it works. And the fact that you can buy votes, it's, uh, you can buy followers. And I mean, how sad is that? You know, I mean, I think I've got about two and a half thousand followers, which to me is unbelievable. Because when I started, I had two followers. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it's a world I don't get, as you know. Um, but but I, you know, I enjoy is, this. It, sorry for interrupting you. The thing is, what it's done for you and I can tell you this as a fan and an observer, it has taken this no, great body of work to a younger audience. And the fan group that you have may not be huge, but it's passionate about your work. It's passionate about what you do. And you're taking stuff that you did 25, 30 years, which is still relative to an audience who now see you as this titan or icon within the industry. Well, That's what social media has done for yeah, and that's why it's very, it's very rewarding, you know. It really is, and I mean, like after last week, for example, when we had our chat last week, I mean, some of the messages were absolutely really touched me. You know what I mean? I mean, one boy wrote, um, I, "I'm so pleased that you're doing a second episode in inverted commas, but I think you need eleven episodes <laughs> to get on the floor." <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Which was a lovely thing for someone to say. Yeah, it could be a series easily. So, yeah. obviously, you've been working um, extensively, you know, since then. You've been doing things in Moscow, bits and pieces in London. But for me, the future is definitely no limits. That has legs to go on for quite a yeah. while. Attitude. Well, what in, in, yeah, well, I'm not in an ideal world, uh, and uh, I tell you who said it to me. Well, I did it in Edinburgh. Charlie Miller said it. When I did it in London, about half a dozen people, including yourself, said it. Mm. And then when I did Dublin, uh, Mark Cheveney, you know, the God of Ireland, Peter Mark, the biggest air group in Europe. And he's a lovely, lovely man. And, and I mean, he, he created the revolution in Subline 1963 with his brother. He said to me, Chief, you've got to take this around the world. And Charlie Miller said, Chief, you've got to take this around the world. You know, Everyone should see this. And I said, and for people like that who really are legendary people, seriously, in everyone's eyes, uh, that was a great compliment. So I need, what I need is I need a L'Oreal or a Weller or a hair company. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to be an expensive bleach. I'm not, I haven't got five stylists to make up artists and friends. I'm me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the reaction I got, I've got a range and I'm not blowing my own trumpet, but you know. I got one in London, Edinburgh, and, uh, and Dublin. And even the Irish, uh, the people at Weather, couldn't believe that people stood up. And the first one up was, was Mark Cheveney. So, I mean, I was astounded how well it went down. But mm -hmm. Ryan and I spent a year and a half putting that together. And it's an original thing. And there are people that should do it, their own version. I would love to see Anthony's version. I would love to see Robert's version, Trevor's version, Angelo and Eugene. But I've got my, you know, I've got my own story, and as you say, a lot of people have reacted incredibly positively towards it, and I'm thrilled. Obviously, I'm thrilled. I'm frustrated. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, you know, the platform that you use and Sorry. that is a live is a live presentation, but it could also work as a as a webinar or a a, a virtual experience. Have you thought about putting it into film? Well, they're making a documentary about me that's been going on for about three years. Um, and, you know, they filmed so much stuff in so many countries and situations. Whenever that gets finished, I'll probably be dead, but I think <laughs> it will look quite nice. Um, I've had a book done um, on no limits, 
all I've got to do is sit down and put words to it. And that was put together by a dear, dear friend of mine who's one of the biggest photographers the world ever saw. And he did it. His, his work's not even in it. Mm. But on the, on the strength of the show in London, he went off and put this book together. And it looks beautiful. Um, but I've got to put words to it. And I'm just not ready to do it. I can't explain it. It's just one personal thing. But yeah. the fact that he would do that, he was... When I first started freelance, he was up in the clouds compared to where I could get to. Mm. So to end up working with him, becoming friends with him, he was at my wedding. Um, that's how close we've become. And then for him, uh, on the strength, because he loves the work that I've done with Trevor Layton over the years, like 30 years, yeah. he's never seen it in its entirety. Yeah. So at no limit, he said he couldn't get his head around how original we were and the level that we set. And Charlie Miller said the same. He, he paid me one of the biggest companies. Charlie Miller, if you don't know him, uh, anyone watching there, one of the greatest Scottish hairdressers, if not the greatest of all time, respect to everybody else. And a real gentleman and a lovely, a proper artist. And he said, when he saw No Limits, he said, just when he thought it was over, he said, more images kept coming. And then when I thought that's probably the end of it, he said, more images kept coming. He said, but the more they said coming, the better they were. <laughs> Which is the time for me. Yeah. It's messy, you know. I mean, so, I mean, every time you and Trevor work together, you do create that little bit of magic. Have you any plans to work with Trevor Layton again in the future? Well, yeah, we want to do it. But as you know, no one's doing anything anyway. And the problem now is, you see, it's the time. Um, apart from this white hair for you, I'm actually 26. <laughs> but in this light, my hair looks a bit grey and I look a bit older. The problem is, there, isn't, there is an ageist thing going on. Um, and I'm not, well, so I'm not being a victim, I'm just being realistic. Mm. You said, when I, so when I was at my height, I was 37. I was working with editors that were 37. I was working with photographers at 37. And I was working with major artists and so models of 18, right? Well, who wants? Some old bloke in the studio who could well be their grandfather's best mate. I work, I, I understand it. However, like when I worked in Moscow, I told that story the other night. The oldest person I worked with over 10 days was uh, 26. And they're all sort of bowing a bit and, you know, you're a legend. And, I've seen them work, and I'm like, well, no, no, no. I'm just a hairdresser. I'll be a legend when I'm dead. Meanwhile, can we get on? And what the, the greatest thing for me, these really young, trendy people and very, very talented group were getting off on this old bloke's hair. And mm. that was the buzz I got out of that. Was and Ryan filmed there for a week, so a lot of that's resorted, so that's great. Um, all I want to do, you understand, I'm sure you and your boys and girls are itching to get back in the salon. I'm just desperate to get in the studio. I'd like a solid week in the studio. But you see, now, my friends, and I've got half a dozen photographers in London who are all geniuses towards my age, but none of them have a studio like they used to because people started renting 20 years ago, it became the vote to rent, hence yeah. the works, et cetera, et cetera. So whereas in the old days, we do each other stay on in Trevor's studio or Evers. That doesn't exist now. So... Straight away, without a sponsor, you know, or a deal, you know, you've got to pay for the studio. I never paid the models. I'm so fortunate. My dear friend, Gareth, um, who used to be Naomi Campbell's, he, he, he was the supermodel's head butcher at Elite for 10 years. Mm. And um, he now has his own lady, his own first models. And he's amazing. I read him out. Hello, mate, come in, whoever you want. Really looks like me like a brother. Lovely, lovely guy, and a brilliant agent. So we get the girls. I've got a bunch of makeup artists who always want to work with me. Uh, we can find a stylist and want to come in. So it's just the studio. Yeah. And, you know, they're not cheap spaces anymore. Or we can go and shoot on location. So if there's anyone out there who wants to be in the studio, thank you. How, how restricted are you, though, by living in Ireland? Does that, does that hold you back from doing the stuff you want to do? Well, the problem, the problem is, I've had this conversation with you before, so far, and believe me, I'm desperate for it. I haven't found a photographer in Dublin yet who speaks my language, hmm. uh, which is really frustrating for me. And 
you know, I'm not being rude. Uh, I haven't looked at a lot of the professional girls. Some I've seen wouldn't do it for me. I've, I actually met three on the day at Weller that I would work with. But there's so many beautiful girls in Ireland. And you know yourself, because um, you've been a head that in, man. You know, you, you, the prime models are not going to let you do it. So over your career, a bit like tennis uh, um, in uh, Glasgow. Oh, Chain. Jennifer Chain. Yeah. That was her whole thing. Never worked with professional girls because she was always looking for a pretty face. Mm. I was rather work with a professional girl than I could because I've given it to you for the camera. Um, but no, I, I, I've got a guy here um, who I met up with who's he's a bit of a landscape photographer. I got him, he set up a studio at his house and we did some wonderful little video stuff and all that. He doesn't have so much confidence on stills because that art of beauty like, you know? Mm. But he's brilliant. But I think I've better convinced him he's better than he realises. But I did some good stuff with him. Uh, and now the warmer weather's coming, maybe we get back in. But I found two girls locally who look amazing. They look amazing. Um, but obviously I'd rather be in London, go down to the works, do three days with eight top girls and, and really buzz, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, you've got to believe it's going to happen. You have to believe it's going to happen. So Keith, we're coming to that time of the evening again. Are we really? And um, but before we go, what, what's the legacy? What what do you want to leave behind? What what? Well, how would you like people to remember Keith Harris? <laughs> well, I'd like to die out in the bank as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, listen. It, um, you know, I, I have my back catalogue of, of work. That's all I can leave. I've got my two boys. You know, one's a filmmaker in Italy doing very well. My other son is a DJ who was due to play all the festivals in Ireland this year, Paul Um, You know, they're both, they're both going to crack on. Um, I don't really see myself like that. I, I, honestly, I don't. I mean, I've been very, very fortunate. I've got some terrific friends um, that matter to me. Um I just want to keep going as long as I want to keep going. You know, uh, I mean, um, mathematically, I'm now going to get cancer again. I can't believe I'm nine years cancer free. Thank God. Congratulations. That's great. If I get, if I get, if I get another nine years, then that's fine. You know, but I don't want to be a burden on my children. And I'd really like to be working. I'm best when I'm working. I, I'm a different person in the studio. I love the bus. So as I say, any wealthy people out there who've got thousands that they're not sure what to spend on, contact uh, my mate Paul. <laughs> I mean, the, the thing I, I want to say, Keith, before we finish up is, you and I have got to know each other um, very, very well over the last few years. And I, yeah. I, I'm always telling you that about how you are recognised within the industry. Sometimes you believe me, sometimes you don't. But over the last two nights that we've done this, the response from our audience and the people out there shows how much love there is for Keith Harrison and, the, and a great desire to see you again. Have you any interest in going on the road and doing your back catalogue, which people are still blown away by those great looks that you did with Trevor Layton back in the 90s um, when you were winning awards? Have you any desire to do that or do you just look forward? No, I mean, I'd love to, I just want to get out there. You know, I mean, I'd even enjoy helping 10 young hairdressers per day to understand little tricks. You know, I mean, I spent a lot of years, 40 plus years, learning the touches from, from the masters and put mm. them into my theme and, and, and made them my versions. And I'm happy to pass that on. Why wouldn't I be happy to pass it on? But I want to pass it on to people that really want it. Not deserve it, but want it. Because mm. if they've got that desire, they're trying to get on. But if they're like, yeah, well, I like the idea, but I've got the time and what's the telly, no thanks. Yeah. And um, no, I, of course, I, I would love to work every time. Um, but as I say, I think I'm going to have to try and get into bed with one of the manufacturers to make it happen. And we're going through such a weird time at the moment, as you know. If and when that can happen, I don't know. But I hope so. I hope so. Just one question before we go. I mean, do you have any regrets in your life at all? 
Yeah, but we need a two-hour show to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so your regret I, is I, I, time to tell about your regrets. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can start with the millionaire's daughter that asked me to marry her when I was about 19. And I said no. Uh, and that's just the beginning of it, the slippery slope. Um, <laughs> There, 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 are, there are a couple of stories that I've never told, and now it's not the, the time. Yeah, I haven't told you, I don't think. But um, listen, everyone's got regrets. None of us get it right, and hindsight is a wonderful thing. But as my son Ryan said, Dad, if you die tomorrow, you've got a fantastic life. And I said, Yeah, but I don't want to die tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I think we've often yeah. said, Keith, that one of the things both of us regrets but maybe it was for the best, is that we didn't meet each other too much in the 90s. Thank God. Well, maybe it was, maybe it was bad, but if, I'm sure if we had met, we wouldn't be here now. I'm absolutely 100% sure of that. Listen, <laughs> we're coming to the end of our two nights, and uh, we, we could sit and talk here forever, because not only do I love listening to you and love talking to you, I just love seeing Thank the you that you're getting from people because the love and warmth out there for Keith Harris and for your story and for for you to come out and do what you do again in public and and and, and on a stage is overwhelming. There's such a great desire for people and I hope after all this is over that you get that opportunity because I for one will be sitting in the front seats. Thank you very much Keith for joining us. Be lovely. And um I look forward to speaking to you again very shortly. And anybody who wants to know anything more about Keith, follow him on Instagram at Keith Harris Hair and send him a large check because he wants to get back to <laughs> working as quickly as possible. We'll speak <laughs> to Keith. Thank you very much. Listen, Paul. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate it. Mate. Love you to bits, mate. Speak soon. And you. You take care.